Hello. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to Olava Talks. Um, this is, I, why do I always try to act like I know how many it, it is? I don't actually know how many it, it is. Uh, this is an Olava Talks to Quincy Gallio. Welcome, Quincy Gallio. Thank you. Hi. Listen, I always sort of first tell the audience, because some people might be watching for the first time, I always talk about what the Olava Talks actually is, okay? Mm -hmm. So bear with me. Olava Talks is a, uh, a, a concept, a thingy, a podcast slash vodcast. It hasn't actually become a podcast yet, right? But soon. <laughs> soon we're going to put it on audio. The intention is that it becomes a video podcast where uh, I invite people whom I've been, so in the last three or four years uh, of my life, I've been meeting a lot of people who inspire me, who teach me, who motivate me, um, and oftentimes also correct me on a lot of issues that are very near and dear to my very survival in this country. So we're talking about issues around queer phobia, about racism, about um, uh, uh, neoliberalism, basically the struggle for more dignified and equal uh, life. And I've been learning so much from people uh, that at some point in the last three, four years, I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't, I, was, I didn't have um, records of those conversations. Mm -hmm. And it would be like e either before a demo or after a demo or like uh, at organizing a demonstration, I would have these conversations with people and I'd be like, oh, the hell, I had no, and you know, and mm -hmm. it would be, and then I would go home and I would realize I had nothing to mem commemorate, but also to, to share sort of with share others. with others those moments. So at some point I was like, I need to have a podcast with these amazing people. And um, I started about earlier this year. And, um, but I also think it's a really important medium to showcase not only these individuals, the struggles, the communities that they're involved with, involved in and the strategies that they come up with uh, to sort of uh, uh, to be liberated, to struggle against oppression. Mm -hmm. But it was also really interesting to show how conversations in and of themselves can be a great uh, medium for creating new knowledge, right? For, uh, but also sharing, for transferring knowledge. Um, so that's how I came up with the Olava Talks. That's mm -hmm. what we've been doing so far. Uh, and like I said, I've been inviting people that, you know, in one way or another, sort of spark a particular kind of like, wow, I need to talk to this person. I need to know more. And some of them I've talked to before in the past, and some of them are new. You're one of the, I think, one of the first people, no, maybe the second person that I've invited, but the before had never really had an in-depth conversation. conversation. So you better be good. I'm just not. <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, no, but I followed your work, obviously. And uh, what was interesting, um, a like two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had a, we had a, uh, um, uh, an Olava Talks with Jesse Abreu from Black Archives. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. And what was so cool was also how many, and it's not just Jesse Abreu, many people in what I feel is like my generation of, of anti-racist activists, all of them can trace back some of the first, maybe not some of the first, but some of the most like, okay, we need to get out there on the streets. Yeah. To uh, to your to your activism to your sort of pieces of racism yeah. is racism yeah. uh, activism and it's interesting. I mean, do you do you? I'm pretty sure you hear that a lot. People go like, because of you, I decided to go down the streets and argue with white people. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, yeah, I, I do hear it. Yeah, I mean, every single time it's like, oh wow, okay. Yeah. I, were you old. were you not aware? Were you not? At the time, because I think sometimes we do this work and we're in the work, but we don't really sometimes see the ripple and the effect that it has. But did you, do you remember when you started getting a sense of how momentous for our generation, that activism, that moment, that you standing there, you know, with those crowds of angry white protesters, like protesters, sort of <laughs> white pro Pete people, and the images of that going on, like going yeah. in newspapers, did you... Did you have any inkling of... No, I think the first time I actually understood how big it was was on the 17th of October 2013 mm. and that was the day that we had the hearing uh, about the permit for mm. the parade in Amsterdam yeah. and I, I got to the location and my, my sister was here on vacation so I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this quick and then go do some sightseeing with my sister. So we end up going to like the Amsterdam Museum and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Side story. <laughs> Side story. <laughs> Side, story. <laughs> Side story. But it's it was fascinating because I get there and first of all there's like a bunch of police. Mm. There's a bunch of news vans outside. I'm like, okay, you know, press. Huh. Okay. Uh, you know. But then I get there and the whole city hall was like the blackest I've ever seen it. Oh wow. There were about four to five hundred people just in the city hall that could not get into one wow. or two rooms they had set up for the hearing. Wow. So you had one room with us um, sitting around the table mm -hmm. as complainants, 21 of us. You had the, the um, organizing committee from the parade. Mm -hmm. You had the people from the complaint uh, committee from the city. And then you had a room which was actually filled more with press than with anybody else. Oh, wow. And then they had a second room which they, because they were like, hey, it's going to be really busy, so a lot of interest. So that room was jam packed, wow. and then outside still it had about oh. four to five hundred people just standing there. I remember coming out of the room after the hearing, and just it was yeah. I still got goosebumps. Yeah, <laughs> I can only imagine. I think yeah. I had some of those moments as well when we were with the Bahrain that campaigning, and you would have moments indeed that we were inviting people to come to the municipality to help us sign the In Rotterdam, all of a sudden, there were more than 200, 300 people showed up. Yeah. And that's, that's really, that's, that's when you were like, wait a minute, this is, we're not somewhere in the margin doing something. Exactly. They were actually yeah. front and center of that. And what is kind of like, uh, 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 um, to me, like sometimes a bit scary, is how being front and center can become also a way when you're somehow platformed or something, can become a way that you're isolated, mm. and and that people sort of start. For example, I've heard I've heard people talk about you in the sense of like, oh, but that's that that that's not really an activist. That's a performer. That's an artist. Yeah. And to be very honest, I don't really understand why activism and art are not. But why would that be mutually exclusive or something? Because mm. I find in my art, I think a lot of it is because of activism or mm. something. But I thought that was so interesting, like how you, you know, this sort of this sort of mechanisms where people get platformed, but also by being platformed, we sort of seem to push them off a cliff or something. You know? no. <laughs> have you have you had any? I won't say regrets, but I've noticed that people come up to me and that I'm like, well, I'm just a person, chill, the fact that I don't know what I'm yeah. doing, I'm sort of trying, but... Well, I think for me, I mean, I make sure to constantly make the distinction between artists and activists. Okay, do you? Mm. <coughs> now, uh, activist has gotten a cultural cachet, mm. but back in 2000, 2011, mm. that wasn't the case. Okay. I remember receiving newsletters from Beryl Beekman, uh -huh. um, having conversations with people who were organizing with Kevin Dynamite, I think, okay. who were seen as fringe elements of society. Okay. Right? The people who were doing the, the Kevin Dynamite, I think, are the same ones who were his friends yeah. in yeah. 1983 when he was murdered. Yeah, okay. And so they're the ones still involved and they're seen as activists. Yeah. So whenever people try to label me as an activist, I'm like, I haven't done the work yet to be okay. called an activist. Mm. Um, people like Simone Zevak, who are organizing with the uh, We Are Here, We Are Here Women. Yeah. Um, people who stand outside and try to block deportation flights. Yeah. Um, people who, who were there, I remember, when was that, 2011, 2012, when people were kicked out of the... They were undocumented, but then they were picked up and arrested, and then they were kicked out of the police station in the freezing cold, and then mm. people came in and picked them up and gave them a place to stay. Mm. Those are activists for me. Yeah. Right? I see myself just as a guy with a big mouth. <laughs> 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 and I've gotten, I've gotten lucky because of the people I know who have given me platforms to say different things and be able to activate others. And I think my work um, in that sense works or, or has been impactful because of everybody else who's chipped in and seen it not as my own and everybody's struggle. I wanna, I wanna, I mean this is, I mean I have theories about this obviously because the other day I was thinking and this, these are my sort of like my thoughts when I'm in the shower or something or like taking a big dump and I'll be sitting there and I'm going to be like but what's the difference between me and say for example um, I don't know because for example a lot of uh, quote-unquote politicians in the PFFA 
like they consider themselves to be activists, right? Yeah. They consider themselves to be at the very front edge of the, they're the critical and they think that they're really saying something. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and they, they have a sense of urgency too, right? So, yeah. and I think sometimes like, what's the difference between, and I think I try to figure out ways to sort of quantify categories or think about activism and how we can define that. And I can't really, I find myself sort of ending up in different dead ends. For example, what you're describing, the work that, for example, Simon de Zeefuyk has done, um, uh, 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 the work that uh, the family of Kevin Ermeyer, yeah? Daimeyer. Daimeyer, uh, the, you know, like people who have, uh, who go down the marches and so on. And I think that we can also talk about that in two ways. We could talk about it in sort of like solidarity work. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that there's a very large group of people who in different ways in the Netherlands, and especially the communities of color, where we do this solidarity work, but it's completely not valued, right? So mm -hmm. picking up people, family members who, you know, sort of, or visiting them who are jailed or whatever, yeah. or, you know, dealing with children that come home from having to deal with, you know, uh, yeah. with the police uh, racial profiling. Yeah. Um, but indeed, uh, like really helping refugees and doing all that work, like as solidarity work, I think that's one way of looking at it. I think there's also a political sort of like reclaiming of streets and going yeah, yeah. out there that is also really interesting that I think is also a kind of activism. Um, I hope always that those of us who sort of uh, sort of are rooted in our struggles and the things that we're talking about and in the work that we're doing who are rooted in communities are also doing solidarity work. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. It's not always the case. <laughs> Uh, I think you have a problem of legitimacy if you're not actually doing solidarity work as well. But I can imagine ways in which... Fine. But, anyways, um, but I also think that there's a particular kind of work that people are doing about that I have center more about claiming space, about uh, finding a ways, create, like finding creative ways to actually speak yeah. and be heard, but also ways of imagining alternatives, which yeah. is also act artistic. Yeah. Yeah, and, but, and, and that's think, also activism, I think. Well, because you sitting there, standing there, and even even the the thought of the of the T-shirt, the yeah. Zwarte Pieters and Sisters, just the thought in and of itself, yeah. is very much like, is very expressive. Like you can't actually. Yeah. That's that's art. That's art. But it is art, yeah. And, and but it what, magnifies, and it, it it's a way of. Yeah, but I think one of, one of the reasons why I wanted that distinction is because on the one hand, you would have a lot of people from the art world, the Dutch art world, who would be extractive mm. um, in terms of social issues, yeah. right? They come in, see an interesting topic, and then pull it out and then use it for their own gain, yeah. while at the same time not repaying or paying back or yeah. contributing to fostering of a climate in which those activists who they use as source material yeah aren't um, given that due, yeah. right? And so you have that, and then you also have the notion of art being in the Netherlands as um, devoid of social context. Yeah. Right? There's only in the last couple of years, you have a couple of uh, uh, programs all over the country which are doing social practice, mm -hmm. in which they're actually focusing on how artists are placed within a social construct. Mm -hmm. but. Ten years ago, that was that was just not the case. Yeah. Not in terms of um, the 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 waardering, yeah. as they would say in Dutch. Mm -hmm. right. And so, what was also in a very monetary sense, also yeah, like yeah. people getting actually paid exactly to okay, yeah. right. And so, what was what was fascinating for me is that by labeling what I was doing as an art project, and for me also to have this distinction between art and activism. Mm -hmm. Um, was to have, and most of my friends completely disagree with me, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it was a way of, on the one hand, hacking the notion of art and the yeah. possibilities of art within not just the Dutch modernist art museum context, but also in context of our communities, right? Yeah. yeah. If uh, one one of my favorite stories to tell is that my guidance counselor of, of Milton Peter College of Saint Martin. Mm -hmm high school guidance counselor, and um, when I told her I wanted to study theater, film, and television studies, she told me, don't do that because you won't come back to the island. Oh, yeah. Right? As Art, if there's no space for you, there's no, there, you can't, there's, there will be nothing for you to come back to. Exactly. If you do that because art is what people, exactly. the white people in Holland do. Art as a profession, which you can live off of, is not something that black people do. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, when I went over the list of 
of uh, programs who were getting scholarships or who were seen as high on the list mm -hmm. of necessity for the island a couple of years back, there was nothing in there from the humanities, nothing arts and culture. Everything was about infrastructure yeah. or, you know, good jobs. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you need that. I mean, if a road is broken and they have a pothole, yeah. I'm not the one to go fix it. Yeah. Right? But I can write a story about why it needs fixing. Yeah. And I think in that sense, um, thinking about the notion of art and what it does within our communities itself, it reinvigorates the notion that art can change physical, material realities because we imagine them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think coming from um, communities in which art is something that you do as a person, right? it's not a different profession, yeah. that already troubles it. By yeah. taking this notion of everyday um, um, or like like uh, Tanya Bugeria, the Cuban artist would say, you know, arte util. Yeah. You know, yeah. taking that notion and be like, okay, so what does that mean if I talk about uh, uh, black Pete, if I talk about Swarte Pete, and it doesn't actually change something physically? Yeah. It doesn't change something materially. It doesn't give someone the leg up to be like, okay, I belong to a larger community to say something. Yeah. And then the notion comes in, like, okay, so what happens when you start to study everything that's been done before, mm -hmm. right? In what type of trajectory do you place your work? Mm -hmm. And how do you then not repeat yourself, not repeat others, mm -hmm. but add that next element to it? Yeah. Making sure that you're building off of something that's already been there. Because I think a lot of times activists um, also pretend that they're reinventing the wheel. Mm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we forget that there's a huge amount, a vast amount of information there, that family members have done things which you don't even know about because yeah. you don't talk about it. Yeah. I mean, I was lucky enough to be in a family where my mom would talk about being on the road with a, with a billboard, uh, with a post and saying, you know, down with, with, with you know, the, the oil companies who yeah. are raising the prices. I mean, she used to talk about that. Yeah. She still does, it's amazing. Right? <laughs> but at the same time, she would also tell me that when she would go, it would be her and another friend, and everyone else who was also complaining wouldn't be there. Yeah. Right? So this notion of what you're talking about, this notion of isolation that happens, is real. It's real, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, for me there, the, the, the distinction of the artist, who places these questions in a social context, who pushes public institutions, who um, tries to uncover all the different hidden mechanisms for white supremacy in the Dutch, um, in the Dutch, Dutch context. It is about making sure that my well-being mm. is, although sometimes I feel, is safeguarded because it's the artist that people attack and not me as a person. Ah, yeah, in that sense. Yeah. Because what is what is what is tricky? Obviously, I think another element of the sort of the issue of activism, and and especially the what you said the the, the cultural cachet that it has come to accrue in the last ten years, is that being an activist in the Netherlands is something which is, uh, uh, which is a uh, which you know is really running certain risks, right? Yeah. Like I mean, we have. Um, for example, the risks of, of, of violence, right? The yeah. Very real physical violence. Like I've been on, at this point, countless demos in the last three, four years. And especially if you're black, and especially if you're of color, especially if you're, you know, a uh, 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 femme, yeah. there is a real, the police has a way of being very, very intimidating. Like yeah. I've had, I've had, when we were demonstrating against Pegida here in Rotterdam, that uh, the police was was shadowing us in like so they were arresting people quite violently like in corners and in in in, in stages you know like yeah. little alleyways and stuff and we would try to figure out ways to like not get caught by the police i remember in Gouda, you know when we were close in the class in Tor, the way that the police sort of cordons up cordons yeah. us off and just pushed us out and just basically all arrested us and and so that's that, you know, so being a quote unquote the traditional activist who goes on the street is full of, of risks to, mm -hmm. your, to your body, to mm -hmm. your, uh, and so on. Like um, here in, in Amsterdam, the last demo I was at, it was so, it was at this point there was, a, there was a, one of our activists, like one of our demonstrators had a small wound at Pride, like a small wound, if we wanted to get an EHBO person, like a sort of mm -hmm. emergency, people who were like walking around who were available to everyone. <coughs> To come and administer some like basic, basic uh, uh, emergency uh, care, 
um, the 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 person like basically said, I won't go to you without a police escort. I won't go to your group and help this person without a police escort. And because we're framed as super dangerous, mm. like this person was afraid of these of us mm. as protesters because there's this notion that. And I think it's really instilled in the Dutch sort of way of thinking about activism and the way they, they conceptualize what an activist is at this point, especially if you're black, queer, and so yeah. on, um, as dangerous, right? Yeah. So, and, and I wanted to talk to you about that as well because in, in December there was this report that linked uh, the movements and the organizations around uh, anti sort of pit, uh, uh, anti sort of pit uh, uh, activism and labeled them as potentially... Um, a threat to national security, right? Yeah. And yeah. and where extreme far right groups in the same report were sort of like talked about as if they were benign, exactly. sort of yeah. bunch of people who. Uh, but they talked about these anti uh, uh activists as organized, and you had some you had some opeds. Vir Duke, I think, also wrote about how we're organized, yeah. and uh, we might be a, a threat. And I found myself quite quickly. Like right afterwards, starting to become, yeah, starting to really sort of be careful what I say or how I say it, where I say it, like who am I seen with, like, like, and and, and it's kind of a shadows thoughts that are behind, but I feel like I want to be liberated from that, but it's yeah. like it really feels like I'm considered a threat. So that's the impact. I mean, you self censorship. That's. Mm. Um, you can't get away from that. Even the, the people who pretend that that doesn't happen to them. Mm -hmm. I would say, no, I can't speak for others, but I would say for myself, there was a period in time in which I was depressed, mm -hmm. um, in which I was being attacked from all sides, mm -hmm. even from institutions, government institutions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was this close to bankruptcy, mm. right? Because um, you lose job, you lose work, you, you lose, lose job. Because people don't want to be associated. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, if it wasn't for Nancy Yao, for example, who was giving me jobs in that period, or for a couple of other organizations who kept inviting me in to do mm. projects, um, it wouldn't have ended the way it did, or or I would not be sitting here the way I am, yeah. right? Um, so there's whether whether you call yourself an activist, artist, or act artivist, there's some really there's some real risks that yeah. you bear in but, the work. Yeah, but the thing with me, I think what was interesting is at a certain point because people couldn't get a grip on me or what I was doing, um, then it became hip to be associated with me. Okay. Right? So at a certain point there was an exhibition at SMBA, Bell and Vice, uh, the Australian arts artist Richard Bell. Mm -hmm. He came and uh, invited a bunch of people to also participate in it yeah. and it was fascinating because my t-shirt was part of the exhibition and the the critic who wrote for the parole said that my t-shirt should be part of the Rats Museum collection now. No way! <laughs> Has it been that? Have they called you? But, I'm so, uh, but I wouldn't do that anyway. No? No, because the t-shirt in and of itself is not the object of the t-shirt itself is not the point. The point is the conversation it engendered, mm. right? Yeah. That's the art piece. Yeah. So if you become fetishistic and, and talk about the material object itself, then it takes away from the power of the project, yeah. which was a conversation that we're still having. Yeah. And I think that's the point where I was thinking to myself, okay, wait, people are trying to hegemonically enclose me within yeah. this frame of, okay, he's cool, we can yeah. work with him. Yeah. And I've seen it happen in certain instances, and sometimes I went along with it because I was thinking to myself, let me see what happens, mm -hmm. how far this goes. Um, and then you realize, okay, so what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What does that mean for my future career? What does that mean for my ideas of a career? Mm -hmm. What does that mean for my idea of the separation between the activist and artist? Mm -hmm. Have I not tipped over more towards um, completely disavowing the notions of anti-capitalist struggles in which I mm, believe in, mm. or am I now part of the system that keeps on oppressing others and sees um, my community as an extraction source? Yeah. Right? How, that's a big, those are big thoughts. Those, those, those are big questions. What did you? What did you decide? <laughs> well, I think it's an ongoing negotiation. It's an on, it's an ongoing negotiation, and also this notion of seeing myself as. Um, 
as a uh, as the trickster who can be mm. within the institutions and also within institutions make trouble. Yeah. Right? Um, I, I did the, the Masters of Artistic Research at the Royal Academy of, the, uh, of Art in The Hague. Mm. And I ended up in a situation where one of my tutors at a certain point told me that he could not talk to me about my work um, because he as a white man felt that me as a black person was telling him that he could not talk anymore. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> ah the fragility! <laughs> right? He was reverse racism right now. I can't critique and you. And it was fascinating. But not just that. Also the fact that he told his wife... Because um, what that, that piece that I just told you was from my end of year evaluation of my first year of the Masters. He gave his wife this piece of paper and his wife then went to like a public function symposium and read that aloud with me in the audience, not knowing I was there. Before, Are you kidding me? No, no, before I got my year year end assessment. So I end up being in the room what? as this white lady is talking about the Tsunami student, right? And I'm yeah. like, what? Okay, I'm Antillian. So even there it <laughs> got <laughs> drawn. <laughs> and so she's talking all of this and I'm listening to myself and I'm like, wait, I think that's about me. So you're like extraction, you're like actually witnessing the extractive really? sort of mechanism at all. And of course she probably accrued a lot of status because she's so cool and exactly. edgy. And she brought that to the, like, the dinner food. Exactly. <gasps> so I ended up filing a complaint within the school because I asked like, what's going on? You know, are these assessments open for all? They're not. And so I ended up filing a complaint which was um, they said, yeah, your complaint is valid, and they ended up changing all the privacy within the school system because of that work. And, when and that's when this guy went up to you and said, I can't critique it. No, no, before. Before he told you you can't evaluate your work. Yeah, because he wrote it. That was my assessment. See, he wrote that as my assessment, and he gave it to his wife. And so that assessment itself was then what I used in a later art piece in my second year, in which I called project I called uh, The Less Laser. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You shady though. I mean, I can not I, I, I did not forget. I can still remember this episode. I've got, I want to talk about it. Exactly. And so... I want my appeal, but I want to talk about it. <laughs> and so that artwork was um, uh, the emails that I sent in terms of, okay, so what's going on, mm -hmm. the, the validation of the complaint committee, and also tweets of mine, because based on my tweets, an article was written, and I responded to that article, and based on that article, the tutor wrote in his assessment. Oh, yeah. So it wasn't even about my work, it was about an op-ed piece that I published. Yeah, yeah. So I included all of those, and I called it the less plays, and I showed it, and um, my director, who's a, who's a sweetheart of a woman, was just cringing the whole time. <laughs> I, 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 these teachers of mine embarrass me so much. <laughs> I would fire him, but contract law, I can't fire him. No, no, he <laughs> left. He left? Pursuant to the debacle? To the... Yeah. <gasps> really? Do you feel bad about that? Somebody's... No. <laughs> Somebody's livelihood you just... <coughs> No, you should have been gone before oh, me. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. So, and, that, and I think in that sense, you know, being that trickster figure, not being able to, uh, no, being able to shift modes, I think that's mm -hmm. what's important in terms of yeah. what I do, right? Because the moment when I came onto the scene in 2011, a lot of people didn't figure me out. Mm -hmm. I remember friends of mine who worked in Hilversum told me that they would be at reductive regadings, so like meetings of producers and, and stuff. And uh, staff meetings, and then um, as they were talking about the different editorial subjects, they would come up and they start talking about what happened to me, like the arrest. And then people would be saying, "But he's a smart guy. Why did he do this?" Uh, right? If you could avoid it, this. Yeah. No, no. But but the idea of when you're black and smart, you don't talk about social issues. Yeah. Because that's the thing. Because that because you're describing all this. And you talk about how, yes, for a while it was kind of hip to be associated with you. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, historically, we know that there are very few activists who gain the kind of national uh, platform and notor notoriety, whether they're considered hip and important and cool or not, but that are able to 
somehow uh, you know live out their old age in comfort yeah. or in peace, right? So yeah. like we look at you know how many like okay, so perhaps Beyonce right now is the exception, but you could be multi 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 million dollar activist uh, artist and be kind of like yeah. activisty. Yeah. Activity emphasis on the E. By the way, <laughs> um, yeah. but the history shows us if you, you know, like Martin Luther King got killed. Yeah. They shot him dead. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, um, there is a history of people whether or not their critique is valid. Well, it, whether or not in their time the critique is is valued. Yeah. Um, there's a history of black people, black artists, black activists always pulling the short end of the stick. Yeah. I, do I mean, you think you're going to, um, do you have aspirations to sort of, um, you know, sort of like beat those odds or do you, how is that working out? To you? Well, I mean, one of the things I wanted to do initially to beat that odd was to become part of the state apparatus itself and become a politician. So nice. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> So I want you're about to this you're about to shame politicians while I'm sitting right here at you. Go bring it, bring it, bring it. I'm ready for this. So I was like, you know what? I mean, politicians have secured for themselves a way of getting monthly funds for, for, for basically just sitting in a room and having conversations. So I was like, hey, I can do that. <laughs> and not just that, I mean, if you're in the national parliament. You get, what's it called? Like for four years, they still pay you back yeah. Like, holy crap, like, dude, that's such a good system. Like, wow. So I was thinking to myself, hey, not to end up destitute, that could be a way to do it. But my girlfriend at the time was like, never know. Mm. Mm -mm. If you become a politician, then it's done. Mm. We still end up breaking up <laughs> with <laughs> She was like, you're going to do what? <laughs> <laughs> and then she still broke up with you. Yeah. <laughs> no. um, and so it's what I, what I've been looking at recently is that notion of okay, so how exactly do you, how exactly have people before us done that, right? Mm -hmm. And in the Dutch context, there aren't that many examples. No, they, they just aren't. No. I mean, Edgar Cairo. I mean, well, you have Frank Martinus Arion uh, in in uh, Curacao. He became a university professor. You have Jocelyn Clemencia, also became. Um, um, she set up her own school. What do you think um, is the future of people like Patricia Kirsten Hout and you and? Yeah, I don't know yet. I mean, cause one of the interesting things about what we're doing, um, like Iris Kensmill, Remy Jungeman, uh, Gillian Gransan. Um, um, Michael Tetcha is that the work that we're doing is still impactful, right? Mm. It's not as if we can lean back and be like, okay, we've arrived. No, we haven't. No. Nowhere near it. I mean, okay, uh, Lady Jungermann and Iris Kensmill are going to represent the Netherlands in the Venice Biennial next year, and that's like a whoop whoop. Yeah. And yet, at the same time, you're wondering, like, wait, why, why both? Okay. Why would, one of them is one of them alone is able to carry that, right? Mm. But it had to be two of them, and initially, three. It was, initially it was three, right? So even there, you you come up to the understanding that even these venerated, these amazing artists are still not valued in the same way as our mm. contemporaries. Yeah, and I wonder when when I hear you talk about this sort of like these futures, right? This sort of how do we beat these out? Sometimes I wonder like. Should I even be trying to be this out? Should I? Um, I get suspicious of myself when I start thinking, yeah, but I do need to pay my rent, and I do, mm. I you know, I don't want to be in poverty forever and ever or something. Yeah, but those are. But the then I get suspicions. Things. But then I go like, but maybe that's kind of a way. That's how you how the system sort of wraps you in comfort. Yeah. And then at some point you you become a gatekeeper. Yeah, but at some not, point you're. But that's not comfortable though. Constantly thinking you need to pay rent. Right? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I think the hunger for change needs to be embedded in everyday practices, whether you have a house over your roof, a uh, roof over your bed or not, right? Over mm -hmm. your head or not. Mm -hmm. But then again, that's also like a privileged position to be speaking of. Yeah. Like, I have not been homeless myself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And what does that do to you? See, I have. See? Right? I've ended up like living in a, like, I've, I actually, 
well, the, it's complicated, but I was living at some point in a, for an extended period of time in a psychiatric hospital because they literally could not send me. I had no home. I couldn't go mm -hmm. anywhere at some point. So somebody was there for seven months. Oh, wow. Yes, I did end up there like because involuntarily committed to start off. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I would, you know, like I, the, the prospect was to just end up on the street, right? Yeah. I've been lucky to actually not end up on the street because they, they couldn't kick me. They couldn't. Like therapeutically speaking, it was uh, uh, it was entirely when somebody comes in and they're com officially committed because they're suicidal and whatnot, and then once you once you're sort of like fix their, I don't know their worst of the of their of their depression or something, yeah. not even really fix, but just sort of stop me from doing it, and then six weeks later you send them outside. Is you basically telling them go kill yourself, mm -hmm. right? So they couldn't do that legally, and so and I I think of sometimes of how I ended up in that place, how having so much debt, having, and I still have a lot of debt, but having so little left in terms of my own income, my own money, um, that I was just destitute and on the streets and the only thing I had was just to die. And I think about ever ending up in that space again and I get scared. Mm. But then for me to not end up in that space again, I really have to maneuver this, 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 this system that will punish us for being vocal on the streets, for being sort of adamant that things have to be different. Mm -hmm. And for, for a system that definitely like sees anybody that sort of questions the status quo, well, I think we're beyond questioning the status quo. We just don't want the status quo. <laughs> exactly. That we're framed as a threat to the, to the peace and order yeah. and national security. And I sometimes don't know how to navigate that without actually ending up at some point. Sometimes I think about this fear as one of the ways the system keeps me indebted to it. Yeah. yeah. And will silence me, right? Yeah, yeah. because the 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 factors outside of your own doing will then pressure you into. Yeah, and at what point do I go from okay, but I can't, I can't ever be destitute again, right? I have to prevent that. And at what point does the system ask of me of its allegiance once some other person are upsetting the status quo? Hmm. When it starts going like, but what do you think about this new upstart? But I think. Yeah. <laughs> But I think as long as you're not, as long as you're not um, standing in the way of someone else doing the, the work, work yeah. then you not wanting to be destitute again mm -hmm. and working towards not that not happening mm -hmm. is legitimate. But then, okay. But then, okay. So we right? have a, we I have mean, a situation. If, if, you, if you do your work and it's not make, it's not you know pushing someone else to not do their work. Yeah. But okay. So you say that. Yeah. But there's a whole bunch of, uh, how much time do we still have left? We still have enough time? We're good? Okay, because I see you move and I get worried. I'm like, okay, fuck, we're out of time because I talk a lot. No, I was asking the same thing. Okay, question. sorry, sorry, just need to check. Sorry. Uh, what was I saying? So we say that, but some of the worries I have in the work that I'm doing, which I sometimes feel like I'm, I haven't really chosen this work. Sometimes I feel like the work has chosen me. Mm -hmm. Or particular communities have sort of I I have people come like you have to do it because no one you know like yeah. from the community then you end up doing things and you're like okay but but sometimes I feel like if I don't do it um, if I'm not always at the edge if I'm not always beyond the edge if I'm not always the most um, how do I say the most you know having the sharpest analyses having the most because I feel like I'm growing into this. I'm learning about a lot of yeah. things. And I feel like a lot of the, the, the playing field outside, there's not a lot of room for that growth, for that experimentation, for that asking questions. So like, I find myself on both ends, whether it be on the right, but also in, within sort of like uh, communities of resistance. I feel like I get scared sometimes. I'm worried that I might not say the right thing and that people are gonna be so pissed. Yeah. And people are gonna be like, "You're like, you're a scam. Yeah, you're, but, I mean, you're like a sellout." I would, and I get scared. And I don't know what to do. Yeah, no. <laughs> yes, I'm, I do have. I have issues with anxiety, obviously. But like, <laughs> no, no. But I, get, I, get, I completely get what you mean. The same thing happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, um, where the moment I was on TV, people were like, "Yeah, but he's not doing it for himself. Mm. Um, he's um, um, he's not genuine." Mm. Um, he's uh, 
but and, and that's in from people who are supposedly close to me mm. right yeah um i've been attacked so many times in effigy and also physically mm. by people within the movement that sometimes you're like okay so wait on the one hand you will physically try to hurt me mm. or or physically hurt me and then in the next you're at a rally exclaiming black lives matter or mm. okay so my black life doesn't matter so what's going on here but isn't that interesting because a lot of i'm sorry but a lot of these people who are the serious online eh? yeah that do not be black people N not always no, but no. most of them that are the most like like on the edge sometimes i block them yeah. because i'm like yeah. and i think that there's a kind of uh, 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 like a like a light veneer of anti-blackness that they don't that we don't that we no, don't even, talk about. But even within ourselves, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people get away with uh, toxic behavior because we're afraid of um, of once again being the group that can't get it together. Mm. Right. So a lot of a lot of bad stuff is condoned. Mm. And I think that's what get that's what keeps us down because we're not as open as honest with each other and we don't connect consequences to the actions or things that people do. There must be room for growth, there must be room for mistakes, mm. but the moment when the mistake is so great that it hurts someone else, then, yes, then, okay. then we need to have a conversation about that. Yeah, and I agree. I agree, like I think that this sort of, the way that we talk about uh, a call out and call in culture, eh, that's a sort of a, like a sort of like a term, a concept that's mm. used a lot in mm. social media, a lot of it sometimes feels like it's always interesting that the people who start going like, oh, I hate the call out culture and blah, blah, are people who have done some really fucked up shit and, <laughs> and are saying, yeah, but the, the way you talk to me, the way you told me about it is, 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 is terrible. But oftentimes I look back and I go, but you could have also just acknowledged that something that you've done or said is hurtful exactly. and committed to doing better. You could have done that. Exactly. And it's interesting. So I think for me, it's not about just that. It's about, I think... Uh, uh, because I think that that's a, a kind of disingenuous frame. Exactly. Yeah. But what I am interested in yeah. is, for example, we had at some point uh, uh, like a certain Miriam, I forget their last name. Oh, Miriam uh, Alra. Alra. And they wrote a piece that was uh, widely shared, widely yeah. shared amongst predominantly white and of color communities of in the movement, yeah. but um, in which black activists, specifically black female yeah. activists, um, where among among the whole as a huge piece, right? But part of that piece, um, black activists in the Netherlands are framed as un not knowledgeable about uh, their histories of like sort of resistance yeah. in the world. They're framed as ineffective. They're framed as you know as sort of like at some point there is this part where it's like. Yeah, you don't even basically like your strategies are not even like you're using this strategy, but it's actually only meant to be used in these and these times yeah. and not even the not even the actual strategy that was used like just another random thing and this person talks about like yeah these women went and no and they no platform to this woman of color yeah, but it wasn't actually what happened at all but still yeah. Yeah. there is this sort of like we can look at what black people are doing black activists are doing and basically go like not good enough uh you don't really get it let me tell you how you should be doing it right and i read the other day an article Volkskrant, in which a group of anti-racists talk about how, and people whom I've heard really troll black activists, and they talk about like, we do it, and our focus is on other people of color to really teach them about what the, yeah, yeah, you know, and yeah. there's this, I get this sense yeah. of people. But I think, I think with, with Miriam, the, the issue was that it was two pieces in one. Okay. So it was one piece which was talking about black Marxism, yeah. and it was one piece that was talking about uh, activism today. And I think there is where the confusion happened because in the activism today, uh, there was also a piece talking about Bill Gay, um, which yeah. was a Canadian Part professor, of uh, at a panel on, what was it? Uh, Post black feminism? Yeah. Oh, no? Um, what was it? It was about intersectional post, feminism post -black and anti-blackness. Exactly, is, is, yeah. Uh, and where on the one hand... And specifically intersectional feminism, the way it's being exactly. sort of... Uh, yeah. uh, 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 it's sort of being um, done in the academia right now. Yeah. With, while black women are being excluded. Exactly. Right, yeah. And then what happened is that... Black women went there. Black <laughs> women went there, and, but not just there, beforehand. And what you get is that the university structure itself made mistakes yeah and there is where all the confusion happened because that incident was then not only in in miriam's piece but then also used by thais Brewer in yeah. van nederland yeah. 
to talk about how censorship was against um, right-wing ideas on universities, which was a completely disingenuous thing, right, yeah. used for racist right-wing rhetorics yeah. about leftist uh, professors. And what happened is that she then online went and said, like, no, um, I was not no platform. I decided that this was not my place to speak if it did not contend with what was going on on the ground in Amsterdam. Which she also said that night. Exactly. Yeah. And so what you see is that um, incidents are are used without proper knowledge, mm -hmm. and then they get into whole different things, right? Yeah. Because what Miriam was talking about was this was this um, notion of activism online becoming part of this call out culture, becoming part of this let's cut each other off by the knees and there's no room for mistakes. Well, I think there should be room for mistakes. Yeah. And I think the way how her if piece... I had, if I had read that in her face, yeah. I would have been very happy to, because I yeah. think that's one thing for me. Uh, but there was, there was an insistence, mm. a very strong insistence in the piece, that black activists, anti-racist black activists in the Netherlands, really do not know their history. And then you manage to like, yeah. do this whole piece and only refer to, like, basically, you don't refer to any black Surinamese, black Caribbean activists from now or in the past that are affiliated in any way with the Dutch kingdom, Dutch context. You managed to write a whole piece of black Marxism, right? Telling these black people rooted here in the Dutch, in the Dutch context without mentioning anything. Yeah, yeah but that's what I'm telling you. I mean, you know what I mean? That's what, that's what I'm like. telling you. The, the piece felt disjointed. And it <laughs> felt as if it needed like an editorial to go over it and that didn't happen. Yeah. But I think, isn't it, what does it say about also the way that the piece was received, right? Afterwards, of by course, that's communities of color insisting, yeah, insisting thing, right? that black people were being essentialist yeah. and being reductionist by saying, yes, there is, there is, we need to talk about who gets to, who gets to, yeah. who gets, who gets to uh, speak on black uh, uh, yeah. struggles, who gets to, uh, who, gets to make, monetize who gets to monetize it. it, who gets to theorize it further on it. Exactly. And, like, who gets to strategize? Yeah. Um, who makes to make decides like, what our priorities are going to be? Yeah. If it's not us, and you think you can do it for us, and you can sort of second guess us along the way, there's a problem there. Yeah. We, were we were like shut down. We were called, yeah. rever like, we were called biological racist, even though I'm not really sure what other kind of racist <laughs> are. But the thing I'm very suspicious of but any other kind of racist. <laughs> but the thing that gets me about the whole online um, conversations, and I used to be part of it as well, right? Um, uh, as Rotary Peters have said, the the first event page was like a litany of conversations that were just happening, we were just going at it. Now, like, okay, let's see what happens. And then the further I got along, the more I realized, like, wait, the face-to-face -face conversations mm. are missing, yeah. right? What was it? Ninety percent of our communication is nonverbal. Mm -hmm. So if you're typing something and it's sarcastic or ironic, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to read that. Yeah. And I think a lot of the, the, the mishaps that are happening now is because that community forum which was forced on us because the limitations of, of communication technology in the 80s, 70s, 60s fostered and engendered a different type of community. I think as a community we're disjointed. And yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I, think so. I think when even talking about um, political manifestations, when talking about economic manifestations, when talking about ecological manifestations, mm -hmm. right, that a lot of people still see the environmental movement as something that is for here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. While the worst uh, cases of climate change are, are happening, happening in the global south, yeah. right? And the most, the most on the edge, most radical thinkers in terms of it, they're not, ha they're not here. Exactly, right? At the most, what we're exporting from the Netherlands is this kind of like neoliberal sustainability consultancy of business models. Exactly. But the actual advocacy for like leave the earth alone, you know, and exactly. repair what you have destroyed is yeah. happening elsewhere. I think it was, it was Yeti Motoren who I saw speak in Imagine I See in like 2009 or 8 or something. Amazing. It was like a Women's Day conference and she was saying like, hey... Is there something that Yeti has not done yet? Yeti like, Motoren is amazing. Okay, well, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, was just like, and then what she said is that um, she was talking and she was looking around the room and she was like, hey, you know, even though we might not think it, we're a privileged bunch sitting in this room. She was like, the woman who is making it work um, living somewhere and mm -hmm. having three jobs, she's not sitting in this room while she is the one who knows how it keeps 
a household running. Yeah. She is the one who knows how to keep a house running, how to keep sustainability running, how to keep food on the, on, on the plate for children. Yeah. She knows how to make yeah. sure that the kids get education. Yeah. She has all of that in her head and she's not here. And she's the one who could be the key to all of our, yeah. our uh, uh, solutions. And literally, these, literally, are, the women, right? these are the women whom, if we're going to talk <coughs> about sort of any sort of sense of development and progressivity in our communities, when we say like, okay, now we have all these kids graduating and going and becoming mm -hmm. doctors who are black and so on. Like, if there is any particular group of people whom you can actually say they have been the driving engine of that, right. not just the politicians, not exactly. the op-ed writers, but these people are the ones who put the food on the table to these kids and also dress them, exactly. and send them to school, and yeah. when they come back from school, say, did you get your homework? <laughs> exactly. And I think, I think what happens and as well when thinking about okay, so what happens when we bring people back together in a room and we have these uncomfortable conversations, then we get to a different part of how do we mobilize. Right? Look, I, I want to agree with you. You know because, why I want to agree with you? Because, wait, wait, because there is, there is a difference between, and I said mobilize, but I mean organize, because there's a difference between mobilization and organization, right? Mm. I think we can get people moving for protests. We can get people to sign a petition online. But can we get people to actually become members of something? Uh, pay membership dues, keep something running, have something sustainable for four, five, six, seven years, or even a hundred years, like for look, on Syrian Look, right? I wanna look. I <laughs> this is intense. I wanna believe you, yeah. mind you, because I. Uh, that's why I decided, for example, to join a political party. I joined two political parties, in fact, because I do believe that at the end of the day, like activism without solidarity work is. It doesn't yeah. that makes no sense. But also activism without a I'm gonna put it this way, without a grab for power, mm. like it is it is then it's just entirely moralistic. Yeah. But it is not at the end of the day, we need to be the ones sitting at the table creating new power. We have to. We cannot have the luxury of being moral and being superior in terms of like but I I know, I know I'm gonna clap back at everyone. Without being at the table and actually making those changes in society, money, resources have to go to particular groups of people who are not getting those resources. Yeah. We need to be at we need to be in power. We need to be there. Where the this is where power is being yeah. you know, so that's why I decided to join a political party and that's why I decided uh, to also do a lot of volunteer work with yeah. LGBT young people and so on because or else you're just untethered and you're just really yeah. comfortable behind your computer and being really interesting and important. Fine. Yeah. I agree with you. However, and obviously, because I'm in politics, I want people, whether they're watching or whether they're reading my pieces, to find me and to join forces because I need help. You can't do this politics without having a base for in terms of figuring out what's happening in the country, without having a sense of like what is it that people think works for them or not. Like you need to have you need to have people. You need yeah. bodies, you need minds, they need to come, and it's hard to get people to join political parties, trust me. It's yeah. really hard. But you can't do without them, or else, again, you're untethered and you're just doing whatever. But I also know that a lot of the kind of, uh, the kind of, even how I've broken through, whatever you want to call it, the kind of attention I've been able to garner, the kind of platforming I've been able to garner was because I did so much on social media. It's because I write all this stuff. And because I've had discussions with people and telling them, calling them out and saying, this is not okay, whatever, you know? And that leverage, social media has become a way for me, and I think for many other people, has not only been a way to find people that are thinking the same, because I felt very isolated. Yeah. Um, literally, I was literally in the clinic when all of this started for me. Uh, you know, how was I going to connect with people yeah. in the clinic? You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and internet and social media. I started off with Tumblr, ended up in Twitter, then like you know, Tumblr. And Twitter. I'm saying you need both, <laughs> but. If we, I find myself being told, whenever I'm at a point where these organizations are actually paying attention, mm -hmm. then they say like, yeah, but you shouldn't go online because we've been talking to you. I'm like, excuse me, that's how I'm gonna lose my leverage. Exactly. But like, yeah. if I shut up on yeah. Twitter, how, then you're gonna be like, we don't exactly. care about you. So yeah. Yeah. I get the offline thing, please come join, let's sit together, work shit out, help each other out, whatnot, it's so important. But I don't know what they were ready to let go of the leverage that we get from social media. No, I think it's both. because. The one hand, um, you need to keep punching up, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that's what social media is good for, making sure that we punch up, but not punch sideways or down. Aha, I like that. Right? Because some of these people were punching down. Exactly. Yes. 
Exactly. That's a good point. And I think it's also a question of acknowledging the 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 power we have. And I think that's a weird weird statement to say. Mm. But sometimes we forget that we do have a voice that is heard. Mm. Right? And what happens when you with your platform, with your voice, or me with my platform, my voice way into discussions without knowing what's actually going on, mm-hmm. telling off someone, and then afterwards you hear like, holy crap, I just scarred someone. I think that's happened to me a couple of times where I realized, wait, okay, I've been asked and invited to join a conversation, to say something, and yet at the same time I know that a lot of people read along with what I write. Oh, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so you better be careful, we're all like, some of us take notes and say, okay, let's try for I'm going to say that next time too. No. <laughs> one, one of the interesting things was that, um, I think, beginning of the year there was a... Wait, wait just question. So you get you get tagged by people I into tagged. conversation. Yeah. I hate that so much. Yeah, yeah. Just as a reminder to people, just do not tag me into <laughs> shit. Especially when transphobic shit is happening in that thread. Oh. Why would you subject me no. to like this transphobic nonsense? No, but for me it's useful because then I can use my leverage within the metrics I'm into then mm-hmm. ask, okay, what's going on? Mm-hmm. So it was an instance where this artist was was part of an event or something who was organizing an event and he invited some German woman who does like a whole bunch of racist black facey stuff. Mm-hmm. But I had done an event with this same organization a year ago. Right? So someone tagged me in it like, hey Quincy, what's going on? Mm-hmm. These are the, these are your friends. Mm-hmm. What are they doing? Mm-hmm. So then I got on my WhatsApp and I, I contacted the organization. I'm like, hey, my name is being dragged to the mud. You better yeah. fix this. You better. <laughs> <laughs> it was cancelled. Oh, nice. Oh, nice job. Right? And that's because the organization also realized they made a mistake. And then they also realized, hey, for me to say something to them in, in the way I said it, also meant that it was serious. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what you get when you then start realizing, okay, I do have a little bit of power and I can make things better. So let's see what we can do with that. And if we're going to have a conversation or a disagreement, I can disagree with you, but I'm not going to call you out. I'm going to be like, hey, I'm going to jump in the DM. <laughs> Feel free to do so. I have no idea why I have not. I took, I've, been, I've been like online now for like, I've been an online person for about three years. And I still don't know why people still follow me. I don't know how anybody knows. What do you mean? Like, I don't know. No. no. You're you know, amazing. I'm no, sorry. do you know how many times I go online and people say something like, this is not okay. I'm like, oh, wait, I just did that last night. <laughs> oh, shit, I did not know. <laughs> like, I didn't know this was a bad thing. And I'm like, look it up. And I go online, Google. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's really problematic. <laughs> you know? And for some reason, nobody has gone like, hey, Olava, you're full of crap. No, but I mean, it's good because we all get to see and we all get to share and you discover reason what you're doing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, just keep on doing it. Yes. And I think in that sense, when talking about the destructive nature, destructive power of, of a Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Snapchat or whatever, it is to think about, okay, so how do you make sure that destructive force doesn't play... Um, doesn't destroy what we're trying to build, right? Mm. We're still trying to build this collective momentum. We're not there yet. Yeah. So if we want to have these, you know, brawl, knuckle down discussions, let's have them in Umsia Inama. Let's have them in Podium Kwaku. Let's have them in- Anywhere but in Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> I know you were about to say another one, no, no, they're great, right. but they're also other I was places. going to say, I was thinking about it here. We must, we must hang out. Oh, yeah, okay. and, the, and the concrete blossom. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, I, 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 think, I think we're saying sort of the same thing. We're saying the same thing, yeah. And but we're just getting there differently and also through yeah. different experiences. But I still, I still want to zero down on this thing where I don't know, I need help figuring out whether or not I am over, overthinking it or I'm over classifying something. But I'm still very much worried by the fact that a lot of these communities who are non-black are, who are left, or so they say, who are complicit in this idea, or certainly participating in this idea that when black people, when black uh, women, when black intersectional uh, activists are speaking out, that they're also dangerous. Because that was part hmm. of the way that it was framed. The situation was 
like this this sort of like uh, very you know very fragile cinema build was attacked by these angry black women who don't actually yeah. even know what they're talking about you know and you know, I saw it I saw it in that article between the lines it was there this is very dangerous they're volatile <coughs> and they don't even know what they're talking about yeah. and we all need to be careful and stop it right now I saw Jazzy felt has wrote a piece right afterwards also yeah. basically going like indeed there is this idea of the essentialist reductionist biologically phenotypical women, black women out there who are on the prowl uh, and so on. And this idea, this framing of the discussions that we have about white privilege as somehow a di di distraction or detraction from the real issues, class, you know, so we're divisive. Like, you have no idea how many conversations I've had with like people from International Socialista, for example. I, I name names, by the way, yeah? I don't do any, yeah. like, I don't know how to be. I don't know how to do it, <laughs> but how people like will tell me like, yeah, but you know, we need to be careful with identity politics because it's divisive in nature yeah. and so on. And there is this sort of like those of us who are saying, uh, yes, identity is important. Those of us who are framed as being identity politicians or whatever, mm -hmm. as dangerous, as inherently dangerous, to me is no different than what in the larger sense. The, and I think it's anti-black and is also yeah. like very problematic when we keep on being framed as as sort of dangerous as a no I, I completely follow okay. you. yeah I mean we're on the same page anyone who says that identity politics is not the way to go or sees it as the in detriment of progressive uh, yeah. values has not been paying attention because yeah. The status quo is white male identity politics. Exactly. So, in fact, I would dare say that politics, by its very function and nature, is identitarian. Like you cannot unhook because what is politics? Politics is that which we think, how we frame our bodies, how we frame our minds, how I mean, we frame our yeah. behavior, how we organize it, what yeah. we value, what we do not value. Yeah. It's all identitarian. It's what people do. Exactly. It's not about what just trees do. Well, it's about well, how we treat trees. You know? but, but even there, the, the notion of identity politics being something that goes out to the individual is wrong because it is something about communities and creating communities. Yeah. So the moment when we start voicing that, hey, these things are affecting us because of certain traits that we yeah. share, yeah. then we're talking about something that's communal. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I think even there, a lot of people like Ewald Engler, Elma Dreyer, uh, wait, no. Mm. All of those. Like, oh. yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, would, I wouldn't agree with maybe I'm not. Um, but like you have these people on the right who have been able to weaponize white male identity politics yeah. and we're not talking about that. No, we're not. Right? We're not talking about Pim Fatan the way how we, how we was able to both utilize homonationalism yeah. and then also present this uh, uh, right wing frame of civilization, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. We're not talking about Leifba Rotterdam, talking about Leifbarheit as something that is Ex about, yeah. about extracting and pushing out people yeah. of color from communities. We're yeah. not talking about Steph Block, who's from the very day who birthed builders, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way how that in and of itself is a continuation of a uh, name's mentality, the business mentality, which is one of the main pillars of Dutch identity yeah. about how do we make money out of the misery of someone else, right? And I think there, when you talk about identity politics, that's the notion we need to talk about. Yeah. That's the identity we need to put Public under the loop. Yeah put under the loop and then think, okay, if this is not benefiting all of us, why is it still part of the status quo and the idea, overall idea, of what politics in this country should do? I think, so to why I was invited to do this interview with Willem Schreko, I think you should go. Do you have time? I can literally call them right now and I'll suggest you go because then you just broke it down. You just broke, we have to wrap up, right? We have to wrap up. Listen, one last thing. Okay, so I always, with Olava Talks, uh, I always organize something to eat. Because I like eating and I like eating and talking to people. And I got these cakes uh, because they're a very fancy little restaurant, vegan restaurant in The, in the Hague mm -hmm. that I heard about. Mm -hmm. And I saw on Instagram and it looked very pretty. And, and normally I always order my cakes at the Heavenly Cupcakes here in Rotterdam, which is also vegan, because uh, I'm vegan. And, uh, but I thought this would help me very good. <coughs> it's shit. And I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I may have almost finished that. I'm not going to name the name of the restaurant. But if you are looking and you made this, it, this is not very interesting. I am very disappointed. 
<laughs> I am sorry I put you through. I think I just the I next one. To... I I owe. I'm gonna. I I I paid a lot of money for this. Like these little cakes to get the cost eighteen fucking euros. What? But they taste. Yeah, I know. But it tastes. Like don't even use sugar or something. Like <laughs> why are you so stingy on sugar? It's eighteen euros. Where's the sugar? <sighs> I am so sorry I put you through this terrible cake. And I, I noticed you had already given up. You're like, I'm not even. I just. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I feel like we could have another one. And another one, another one. We have a lot to discuss. And I might invite you again. Um, oh, interesting. These are vegan corneos. Vegan ice cream. cream. <gasps> you just saved this Olava Talks. Okay. Uh, say, say hello. Say, she just saved this Olava Talks because this is probably going to taste a lot better. Thank you. <laughs> now that was the wrap. Thank you. Thank Do you, you. want to say anything left? It was, uh, it, it, was, it was wonderful. Yeah, did you yeah, like it? It was yes. a great conversation. Thank you. 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 <laughs> you see how these conversations go everywhere? Exactly. Like we, I thought we were going to talk about them, but we talked about it. It was really fun. Yeah. Really awesome. Yeah. Thank you.